Hi there, uh, Zeb from Darling Dork, and today I'm going to be reviewing a game called Twilight Struggle. Now, some of the more hardcore geeks in this audience might wonder why I've chosen this game, because there have been about 8,392 reviews done of Twilight Struggle. It's, at present, the most popular game on Board Game Geek. It's, I think, number one in popular gaming, and in, as well as war gaming. So my review might not add that much, but I'm here to try to introduce the game to as many people as possible talk about some of the history behind it because it is a game that is very much driven by history. So let's just jump right into it and go over some of the components. What do you get with this game? Uh, you get the board. This is the oldest edition here. Subsequent boards are made of slightly sturdier material. This is just basic kind of flimsy cardboard. You have influence counters, which I've placed all over the board as such. They have little numbers. I'll go into those in a minute. Some other associated counters that go with markers on the board. And then the other really big components, the cards. So this is an example. The action cards are one of the critical components in the game because they are the chief mechanism by which players either uh, exert, do operations around the world or screw with their opponent. So one side plays the United States from 1945 until 1989. The other side is playing the Soviet Union. And they're each trying to outmatch each other in influence around the world. Now, this is not a military-style game. You conduct coups and, and fight limited wars, but you don't ever fight a nuclear war against the United States. In fact, if a nuclear war breaks out, which can happen, uh, the person who launches the war loses. Because it's safe to say that in a nuclear war, there aren't really that many winners in a, in a true sense of the word. Um, instead, the goal is to gain dominant positions in a given continent by taking control of the key battleground countries. So two kinds of countries, there's battleground and non-battleground. Battleground are easy to tell. They have a purple uh, background right there. Each country also comes with a stability number by it. So Zaire, which is not a particularly stable country, has a one. The UK has a five. That number determines how much influence one country has to have in it before it controls it. So if I only have two in the UK, it might be friendly to the United States, but that doesn't mean that it controls it or is sufficiently strong enough to be an ally. So basic game setup. Each person is going to start the game with eight different cards. Now the cards come in three different decks. They are supposed to reflect different periods in time. So there's early war, mid war, and late war. The early war cards slightly slanted to the Soviet Union. So some examples, one card like this, Warsaw Pact formed. Um, when this card is played, you can play it as an event. The one that happens when you play it as an event, you remove all US influence from four Eastern European countries or add five USSR influence, no more than two per country. So you add influence, you subtract influence however you like. Cards like this have a little star next to the name. Um, when you play them as an event, they're removed from gameplay. They're not shuffled back into the deck. The other thing that you can do, each card comes with a number printed beside it. So in this case, it's a three. I can use it for operations around the world, and there are three kinds of operations that you can perform. One, you can place influence in countries. Um, it's pretty simple. You, you can only place influence in countries adjacent to where you have influence. So with this setup right here, I have Czechoslovakia under my control. I can place influence into, into Hungary. I cannot place influence into Yugoslavia yet because I'm not adjacent to it. Now, if there was a card, say, an event that let me put influence in Yugoslavia, then I could do that. That's one option. The second option, realignment rules. What a realignment role is, it's uh, a way of taking influence out of an enemy adjacent country. So let's say West Germany here. West Germany has four US influence. The Soviet Union has three in East Germany. I want them to lose control of West Germany. So when you play a card you have for realignment, you get however many rolls are printed in that number. So in this case, three. You add up how many adjacent enemy countries there are that are controlled. So France has one and East Germany is one. So each player gets a plus one modifier. Um, if it's adjacent to your enemy superpower, you get a plus one. If the rolling player has more influence than you, than you in that country, then they get a plus one. So both players roll dies with those modifiers. We'll say the Soviet Union rolled a four, the United States rolled a one. We'll pretend there aren't any modifiers here. The US has to remove three influence from that country, taking it down to a one, and they lose control of it. This is an important way that control of a region can shift back and forth. 
the final thing that you can do are launch coups. Coups are fun. You double the country stability number, so with West Germany, four. Yeah, and then you, you, so you double that number, then you take a, the card's um, operations value, in this case a three, and roll a die. So double its stability number is eight. Three and then two on the die would be a five. My coup d'etat does nothing. It does have an important secondary function. Each country or each player is required to do a certain number of military operations in a given turn so that they don't look weak next to the other player. Um, because I've just played a three ops card, my required military ops go by, up by three. If the United States does not match that, they will lose points correspondingly. They look weak compared to the mighty Soviet Union. So those are the basic operations that you can carry out in the game. What does it all mean for scoring? Well, there are scoring cards that come into it. Scoring cards look like this. You get a certain number of points depending on whether or not you have presence, domination, or control in a region. And it happens for both players simultaneously. So having presence in a region, you just have to control a country. It doesn't have to be a battleground. To have domination in a region, you have to control more countries than your opponent and more battleground countries. So we'll say in this example, France is not controlled by the United States. Um, it only has the UK and West Germany. The Soviet Union would have domination at this moment. Then control, you must control more regions and all of the battleground countries. So you'll notice for Europe, if you were to score with Europe and you have control, you simply win the game. That's reflected perhaps in a historical fact that Europe really was the centerpiece of the Cold War. Anybody who was deemed to control Europe probably just flat out would have won the Cold War. Other regions score fewer points. So if you control Africa, you only get six points. And then you get um, one additional point for every battleground you control. So we'll say I control Africa. And I have every battleground, so that would be six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. The points track just goes in one direction at any given moment. So if I scored 11 points and I was the United States, I would go from 0 to 11. The game ends instantly if any player manages to get to 20 points. As I already mentioned, the game will end if we get to DEFCON 1. So how we get the DEFCON track moves, every military operation that takes place reduces DEFCON. So let's say I launch a coup d'etat in France, which would be hilarious. DEFCON moves down accordingly. Suddenly, we can't do coups or realignment rolls in Europe anymore. The situation's gotten too, too hot, so to speak. Then we'll say the Soviet Union correspondingly launches a coup in Asia. DEFCON moves down to DEFCON 3. So those are, the, those are the basic operations of the game. So how a turn looks, everybody starts with eight cards. In the first few turns of the game, you only play six action cards at a time. After your Turn four, everybody gets a hand of nine instead, and they play seven cards. So to begin the turn, each player picks an align or a, a headline card they want to use. So they set it in secret in front of them, and they flip it over. The Soviet player reveals Warsaw Pact form, the card I used earlier. The United States player plays Marshall Plan. Marshall Plan allows for the play of NATO. It gives influence in Western European countries. These events go off. Then for the next several turns, starting with the Soviet player always, each player plays one card back and forth. Now, you'll notice there aren't, the event deck is all one thing, so it's possible, in fact extremely likely, that you will get enemy events associated throughout the turn. So in this hand, we'll say on the Soviets, I have Fidel, which is good. Fidel is a Soviet event. I also have U.S.-Japan Mutual Defense Pact. Now, you'll notice that it has a little white star. That means it's associated with the United States. That's not good for me. I don't want that to happen, because that means that the United States will control Japan, and I can no longer make coup or realignment rolls against it. It basically locks down Japan pretty well for most of the game. So what do I do? I don't want this card to get played. However, if I play an enemy event, um, the associated text will go off. So I can play it for its operations value, the bad stuff will happen to me. What's your out on that one? You have a space race track here. Anytime, once during a, a given um, turn, you can take a card and send it to the space race. Basically, it has to be of a certain ops value. You roll the die. If it's successful, you move up and get points or certain benefits. If it's not, nothing bad happens. You just get to discard the card, which in that case, I don't want that card going off on me. It'd be very bad. 
you can continue like that. Um, the game is played over the course of 10 turns. It seems that the Soviet Union has a, has a slight advantage early game. Some players I've heard complain that the Soviets actually have, are way too powerful early game. However, it balances out because late game, things turn drastically against the Soviets. They have some of the worst cards imaginable late game because the US has so many against them. So over the course of a longer game, the game actually does balance out quite nicely. Both sides are evenly matched if you can get into turns six or seven because by then things are starting to stack up against the Soviets. And if they haven't built up enough momentum, they're going to get crushed in the late game. So that's, that's the basic gist of this game. One last component I forgot to mention, the China card. You'll notice that China is not a region that you can control in this. It's been abstracted to this card. So how it works, it starts with the Soviet Union. Every time it's played, it gets passed to the other player. So if the Soviet Union plays this in turn two, it gets passed face down to the United States. In turn three, it gets flipped over and the United States can use that. And what that reflects at a kind of a historical level is the fact that the Soviet Union and the United States both used China against each other at specific moments. So in the 50s, China and the Soviet Union were allies. By the early 70s, the United States was using China to try to end the Vietnam War. So it's, it's kind of a third force that doesn't really belong to either side in this game. Later editions have some variant rules that require you to place additional influence in China before it can join the main game but I'm playing with the first edition here, so we'll just pretend that that's the case. So that is a very long-winded ramble on how this game works. What do I actually think of it? I love this game. I love it passionately. I love it because I'm a history person, and it, it's specifically built using historical events, and it's made with a certain love and craftsmanship of somebody who really appreciates this era. So you might have some obscure events of stuff you didn't know. The rule book comes with um, a manual explaining what every event's significance is in this game. So, for example, the card Kitchen Debates refers to a famous debate between uh, Richard Nixon and Premier Khrushchev regarding standards of living in the United States and the Soviet Union. They're little gems like that. It also, it captures the mentality of the Cold War because it's not a struggle that's necessarily military so much as it is political. And it is about making sure these specific regions correspond to the interests of your side. It encourages a certain paranoia because you know that your opponent has certain cards that can really screw you, but you're trying to guess when they're going to come out, and you're trying to stay way the hell away from nuclear war because you know that nobody will win in that outcome. It feels very faithful. The game has run into some criticism in the past couple of years because it also presents a very U.S. and Soviet-centric view. Um, Canada, for example, doesn't do anything in the course of this game. In fact, in the base edition, there are no specific Canadian cards. Um, what people have done in recent years is fans have started creating their own event cards to go with, and the company has responded in kind with this. So one of the fan variant cards I saw was Red Army uh, Canadian hockey game from, I think, the mid-'80s, in which the Canadians just beat the living hell out of the Soviets on the ice. So they've tried to make the game appear to a more um, diverse audience that way. It's a great game. I really can't recommend it strongly enough, and the subsequent editions have only improved it. Other games have also started to kind of follow on this model. The card-driven ward game style um, is becoming a really popular thing. So I think we're going to continue seeing games like this. If you're willing to give up three hours of your life playing this, I strongly recommend it. It's a fantastic experience. Thank you.